All right, we're going to cover a lot. We're going to talk about theory. We're going to talk about practice, case studies. I'll be around for the rest of the conference and at the evening cocktail party. If you have any questions, we can go over it then. So let's get into it. So we're going to talk about getting creative because we want to reach our audience, whether you're B2B or B2C. There are people out there that want what you want, that need what you want, and you want to connect with them. So when you're doing this and you're doing organic um, SEO or paid search, it's possible you keep going to the same well. You get stuck in the same research rut. And you just keep going in circles, coming up with the same words, coming up with the same content all the time. So what you want to do is look for those untapped opportunities. Now, you hear a lot of talk about things like latent semantic analysis, natural language processing, rank brain. I mean, this is all great, except it's now Monday, 9.23 AM. You're at your desk. What do you do? How do you actually make this actionable? The good news is the answer is right in your pocket. We're going to take a look at your audience's problems, opportunities, questions, and thoughts. So P-O-Q-T spells pocket. So we'll be revisiting these folks as we go along. So when you're in those brainstorming meetings that we just heard about, and you're trying to come up with new ideas, keep in mind the problems, opportunities, questions, and thoughts of the people that you're trying to connect with. So obviously Google AdWords um, has a keyword planner. It's free. It's kind of the default go-to. You're like, well, heck, it's Google. They should know. But the thing about this is, First of all, they've scaled back a lot of the precision of the data. Secondly, AdWords Planner is only representing the universe of keywords that people have bid on in paid search, which means if there are keyword opportunities out there that people aren't buying ads for because it doesn't make sense maybe to buy a PPC ad for, it's not going to show up in Keyword Planner. So if you think about it, the, the amount of brand new searches there are per day there's 3.3 billion searches going on in Google every single day. And out of that, 15% of those have never been seen before by Google. Which means when you do the math, there's a half a billion searches that will be done every single day Google has never seen before. Do you think you're going to find them in Keyword Planner? No. So the good news is the opportunities are out there. You just have to know where to look. So we're going to start by figuring out how do we get some new seed ideas to start this process. Now, um, how many people here are familiar with the ZMOT framework? OK. A couple of years ago, Google came out with this as a way of uh, explaining to people that uh, Procter & Gamble had something called the first moment of truth. And the first moment of truth, for example, in consumer packaged goods is when you walk in the supermarket, you're encountered with a whole shelf full of different cereals. And you're going to choose and you were stimulated by advertising or what you heard or, or whatnot, and you make a decision, and that's the first moment of truth. And then you come home, you pour a bowl of cereal, and you consume it, and you decide if you like it or not. That's the second moment of truth. Well, there's an analogy to this in digital, except there's a moment before that, which Google dubbed the zero moment of truth. So that's to say that first there was a stimulus, like something happened, something occurred. And then people formulated their problem, opportunity, question, or thought. That was the zero moment of truth. And then they went to Google, typed in their keyword phrase. They got a list of results in the search page. That's like the supermarket aisle. And they clicked on one, which is equivalent of picking that box of cereal up off the aisle, which led to the second moment of truth, which is winding up at your website. And then they're going to make a decision. Did they like what they're consuming here? Do they want to come back? Do they want to? Um, learn more, do they want to sign up for your newsletter, convert, whatever. So we start with some new seed ideas, and we map them against the problem, opportunity, questions, and thoughts of your audience. And then we start to do some analysis of volume and viability. So what do we mean by that? You want to look for areas where there's a lot of people searching for it, but not a lot of people competing for it. It's not as much competitive um, for competitive um, results for it in the search. Okay, so we're going to run through some examples using the idea that let's say we owned a piano store. It's brick and mortar, but there's a website, um, there's some B2B, there's some B2C involved. So first place we can look are online communities. And Wikipedia, you know, we don't think of it as a community, but really it is. It's where a lot of people are crowdsourcing um, thoughts, ideas, information, and facts, and alternative facts. 
and it gets edited down to what's actually true and popular. So he tries to type in piano. That takes us to this great page full of keywords. Musical instrument, keyboard, popular music, composing, rehearsal. Now, if you have a piano store, some of these might not be words that would occur to you as you're doing your content marketing, but it's all very semantically related to piano. So there is a C also with, with a lot of other great ideas. And what's significant about this is, this is not just like one person coming up with this. This is a whole community of people saying, yes, these words are strongly related to this. It's what's of interest to your audience if you have a piano store. Quera is also another community. And it's a fantastic question and answer site. Just type in your, your head term, pianos. You get related topics with a lot of great keywords. And what's fantastic about this is you get the questions. They're asking them right here. So problem, should I quit playing piano and come back to it later? Um, idea, I'd like to play the synthesizer. Or a question, is it okay to learn and practice with a digital piano? So, just like Google has auto-suggest, most of these platforms out there have an auto-suggest built in, into them as well. So for example, in Quero, you type how to choose a piano, and you're getting some other ideas. How do I choose between piano and the keyboard? What's the best 88 electronic piano available? Customer review sites are a great source as well. So I just typed in piano reviews, and I came up with piano keyboard reviews. And for this one instrument, you looked at the user reviews, and a theme emerged. And amongst all the different attributes a digital piano could have, obviously there's the price, and the sound, and the features, and the weight. There was one that emerged among the reviews, which was, how did the keys feel? So they use phrases like keyboard action, feel of a grand, grand piano keys, feel of the keys, key action. And the reason why I have Hummingbird in there, because it was in the Google Hummingbird update, Google starts to look at the semantic relationships, kind of the word clouds, and how they relate to each other. So that if you want to rank, uh, just stuffing the same keyword over and over again uh, is not going to be as effective. It, it's looking for a thematic connection. So here are a group of real human beings giving us that information for free in the course of this review. So discussion forums, um, depending on the space you're in, are still a thing. Um, I typed in Piano Forum, came up with a whole list. There's one, pianoworld.com, not the most gorgeous site, but there's a lot of words on here. And right there on the left, um, curated and already prioritized are some other great uh, keyword terms to start looking at and targeting. Boardreader.com is a site you can use to search across multiple forums all at once. So there's a power tool for you. And right from there, we're pulling off some great ideas. Record using a DAW, acoustic pianos, moving pianos. I know nothing about pianos. So if you have the piano store, you can maybe create uh, an article on your site. What if you know nothing about pianos? Where do you start? Twitter can be a useful source. Again, we type in our keyword phrase. And we come up with a trend. Cities across the country are taking old pianos, having artists paint them, putting them out for the public to sit down and play, creates YouTube content, it's really great. So you can start newsjacking topics like this, maybe create a roll-up article of like the 10 cities across the country doing you know, piano in the park programs. Now you can link to them, they'll link back to you. You'll get some PR, it's interesting content, and now you're tapping into what people are talking about now. Conferences like this are excellent. So consider what are the conferences in the space where your audience is attending. You search for them. For example, it came up with um, this keyboard um, teaching conference. And when you look at the titles of all the topics, you're getting some great keyword phrases, and you're getting what's of interest to your audience now, this year, because this is what people are talking about. So here, notation tools, piano studio, instructional videos. Again, maybe it's not totally <coughs> bottom of the funnel you know, for, for your audience to click and buy a piano, but it's what's of interest to them to get them to your site so that you can build trust and credibility and start to nurture the relationship. Now your own website can be a great source for keyword phrases as well. For example, most sites have an internal search form. If you don't, I uh, might consider adding one. And then once you do, um, you get a lot of great data. Now interestingly enough, only 7% of companies feel like they're effectively using this data. 
Because normally it, they, they, it just looked upon as a functional piece just to um, accompany the menus and so forth. Um, but it's very easy to track. If you're not doing it already, for sure do this as soon as you get back to the office or have your webmaster do it. Turn on site search tracking. You add in the query parameter and you can even add categories. And what you get is fantastic data. So now the question is, well, why do people use that search form? So the good news is they're using it because they are happy they got to your site. Somehow they looked at the site and said, you know, I think what I'm looking for is here. I haven't found it yet, but it might be here. So they use the form. Secondly, they want to know more. Uh, they have strong user intent. And they have some hope they're going to find it because they're investing time in your search form now as opposed to Google search form. Now, there's possible bad news. Bad news is your site sucks. It's complicated. They don't understand it. The way you've organized things and labeled the menus doesn't map to how they um, use terms for those things. Um, so it's worth taking a look at. So if you get a lot of people searching for things and not finding it, like, why didn't they just click on this menu item? Might be time to do a little usability testing. OK, so when you look for this data, you want to look for overall themes. And you do this by stretching out time parameters, maybe like six months or a year for however long you're, you're collecting this. You're looking for the high value searches and start to segment the channel that they came in. So what are the searches from people who came in from our PPC campaigns compared to social or referral or direct and so forth? By looking at it different ways, you'll get some interesting data. Another great place on your website are the inquiry forms. Now this data normally just goes to your customer service department, your sales department, administrative, whatever. It doesn't often get to marketing, but that free form text field where people can type in anything they want, believe me, people type in anything they want. This is a channel that's where they're talking back to your organization. And if you get this data and start to parse through it, and start to roll up and again, look for themes, you'll find some interesting intent, you'll find problems, you'll find opportunities, you'll find questions, and you'll find thoughts baked into this that people generated on their own. So you can even take a specific page of your site or a competitor site and for example, we popped in an SEM rush and we're able to come up with the keywords that people use to get to popular pages on our competitor sites. So you can take a look at the competition, analyze them, and reverse engineer how to get some of that traffic for yourself. So we talked a lot about organic. We'll talk a little bit about page search. Like, like can you, was, how applicable is this if you're doing AdWords, for example? And you know, typically when you do AdWords, it's all about the money, you know. Well, Fred, we spent you know, 10,000 AdWords this month. How much did we make from those ads? So your business might not be you know, a, a click and buy type of business. Maybe there's, it's a brick and mortar organization. You want to drive traffic to a retail store. Maybe it's a larger purchase that people aren't going to buy when they first encounter you. You have to build the trust and relationship and start to nurture that relationship. Maybe it's B2B and it's not really e-commerce. You know, the famous, you know, the multiple tiers, this is, you know, 100 a month, 500 a month, call for price. So if we had a game plan with this, we can, we can map what we learned before into your paid search and start to identify what are the higher funnel keywords that are, gonna, that are going to drive traffic in the end and create the content that's going to pay off. Um, and in the whole long SERP, how do we create ads to make sure we're visible? Um, we want to make sure the attribution is tracked beyond the first touch, obviously, because this is not a click and buy type of scenario. So going back to our example of the, um, how the digital piano keys feel compared to a real piano, um, I searched for digital piano best keyboard action. And first of all, Google Suggest gave us a variety of top, mid, and bottom funnel searches. So Google's like testing us out a little, saying, well, what do you really want? Like, where are you right now? Um, even the, the, the search instead for gave us um, a, a higher funnel than we put in. Because usually when you say best anything, you have a little stronger purchase intent. So we got the PLAs, the product listing ads, total bottom funnel. Even though I'm searching for the best keyboard action, it's showing me like, well, okay, here's, here's entire keyboards you can buy. It's like, not there yet, Google. Um, we got this great um, rich snippet which is incredible. This got pulled from the website, and we'll dive into this in a moment. Um, as a matter of fact, this is that entire page. 
So this page is comprised of some top funnel content, some bottom funnel um, grid with, this is what it, where it pulled from. As a matter of fact, it, it didn't require any special um, uh, schema tagging or, or, or anything fancy. It's a straight up HTML table. And Google said, this looks very interesting. And as a matter of fact, what's interesting about it is what's on the left is what Google had. What's on the right is on the website. Google figured out from the query which columns out of all those columns to pick, model, keys, and action. So when you think of the information you have, if you have information that could be structured in a way, in a table um, that could be of use, you might get lucky and Google will pick it off and feature it prominently in the SERP. Some more top funnel content, some bottom funnel um, affiliate links to Amazon, um, some videos, more content, um, buying guides, related articles. There's a lot going on here. This is a, a really deep article. And that's everything. Okay, so back to the SERP. If we analyze it, we'll see it's a combination of top, mid, and bottom funnel. So we've got um, informational sites, affiliate sites, and e-commerce sites. Again, Google's kind of testing us out in our query. Way at the bottom, though, the only ad, the only ad that people paid for, other than the product listing ads, was a total bottom funnel. Oh, digital pianos, yeah, we sell them, click here. When all I was asking about was, what's, tell me about the keyboard action. So, question is, what would it take to get a decent position from down there and slide up above everything, including the featured snippet? So, the first thing you need, you need is a quality landing page. The same principles apply for organic SEO as a good landing page for PPC. Um, <coughs> And also, as you're creating this content, keep in mind these folks, once again. So when we look at uh, the modified search digital piano keyboard action, we look at the ads, we see a bottom funnel. Hey, we have digital pianos. Another one, PLAs, and this craziness, um, a dynamic keyword insertion, digital piano hammer action. I don't think you can buy digital piano hammer actions at Amazon. It's just one of those goofy, somebody inserted a keyword, so somebody's sleep at the wheel on the Amazon PPC team. So what would these ads look like if we took everything we learned in that first part and started applying it to our PPC ads? So here are some ideas. Digital piano keyboard actions, which are the most realistic, which simulate real piano keys, which have the most realistic feel. They're not all the same, learn more here. So it's the idea of you're taking the language and the phrases that you learned from your research baking them into your PPC ads, driving them to a landing page that pays off on these problems, opportunities, questions, and thoughts. Now, what do you do? You can drop the first party cookie, you can retarget them, you can hit them up for more information, you're building brand awareness, you're building trust. You say, yeah, but I'm paying to drive traffic to this. How does that map out? So if you were gonna buy the term digital piano, you'd pay about $1.22 cost per click. But if you went higher funnel and targeted best action digital piano, it's 26 cents per click. Or best digital piano action, only 80 cents per click. So you'll probably pay less for these longer tail keyword phrases. You're gonna get people to your site. It's probably a um, type of purchase they're not gonna make instantly anyway. And now you're starting to build your brand in the process. So there's a couple of um, keyword research tools out there for free you can use to help this process out. One of them is called answerthepublic.com. So this is kind of like um, Google suggests combined with other terms. So you type in your term pianos, and if you're using this, make sure to set the little um, selector for country to US, because it defaults to UK, so the results might be a little different. And then it turns it into questions. How, why, when, what? So why do pianos have pedals? How do pianos work? Which upright piano is at best? My God, they are writing the blog post titles for you. Like every one of these, boom, go. Prepositions, pianos near radiators, pianos for sale near me, um, pianos to avoid. Visualwords.com, uh, this was uh, based on research at Princeton University. It's free. It's just giving you some ideas for semantic relationships between words, and it's kind of fun. You click on it, and the graphics move around and so forth. Um, Infinite Suggest is Google Auto Suggest wrapped with a layer of functionality on top of it. It's pulling the data from there, 
but allows you to filter them and sort them and export it to an Excel spreadsheet. So you put in your keyword term and boom, you just get a whole list. So instead of typing in it over and over again and then writing them down or copying and pasting, this is a power tool that does it for you and it's free. Also, um, SEM Rush started out as this free tool, which is still available, seoquake.com. You install it as a plugin on Chrome or Firefox. And then when you do a search, you get all this extra great information. So you can start to see what's working and what's not for your competition and even for your own site. You click on any one of these pages, you get a sidebar with a lot more information related to search and also social. And then you can drill down, take a look at the, the information behind the page, even do a quick page SEO audit. This also is completely free. So this is seoquake.com. So in summary, don't get stuck in the same research rut. Keep in mind for the people you're trying to reach, what are their problems, opportunities, questions, and thoughts? And when you're brainstorming, consider the range of places you can look, online communities. Look in your own website, look at competitor sites, and use these free keyword research tools that are out there. Keep in mind that when they, when they come to your site, they had an existing situation, and that you need to pay off on that second moment of truth with the quality content once they reach it. Balance it for volume and viability using tools like SEMrush or other great tools that are out there. And then when you do your PPC campaign, utilize the same data and research you gathered to write ads that are going to resonate with these same folks as well. And if you're ready to use a power tool, SEMrush offers you the ability to do this for your competition, plus your own site, and a lot more. So remember, whatever you're doing, B2B, B2C, when you're researching to reach audiences in search, the answers are always right there in your pocket. Thank you. Too much fun. Uh, so this is a, a little bit of a side talk topic, but in line with SEO and, and, and titles for your articles, have you found that, um, that there's a, a range of words or range of characters that seem to do better? For some reason, I've always gone with you three words no more. But I, I wanted to see if you had an opinion about that. I'm sorry, did you say use three words? Three words. In your article title? I like to use three words in article titles because I think it's the quickest. Then you, don't also, you also don't have to worry about it getting, you know, like the title cut off in the description on Google search. It depends on the amount of characters. Okay. Really, because you, 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 it, it's good if it doesn't get cut off for sure. But the most important thing is it's that supermarket aisle with all those cereal boxes. That's what happens when people see those search results. You plus nine of the results, plus ads, plus featured snippets, whatever. There's got to be something in there that grabs them that says, yeah, you know what? It's worth me taking at least two seconds to find out more. So I, I wouldn't necessarily limit to a number of words. I, I, ideally, you try to get as many words, many characters as possible without getting cut off. Okay. Any other questions? Great. Well, I'll be around. Um, thank you very much. Awesome, thank you.